My name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael, right across from the spooky, what is this, Graceland Cemetery? Is that what's over here? Graceland? Probably not Graceland. No, I think that's what it's called. I'm not even kidding. I don't know. Uh, We record across from a giant cemetery. It's the big one, right? It's It's the big one. Yeah. The big, like, 12 city block. Yeah, right. The one, the one where you where you go on Google Maps and you say, "Oh yeah, they have Grant Park and Millennium Park." Oh, what's that park? Oh, that's just dead people underground. Yep. So this is where we bury all the people that don't make it out of Chicago. Uh, you're listening to Double Feature, and we have a, a show about. Uh, well, there's some dying on the show today. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, what movies are we doing? We're doing Rogue and the Innkeepers. Someone dies in one of the films. Yeah. You know, by your um, by last year's year end finale episode, if anyone made it all the way through that train wreck, uh, you would probably have considered that a spoiler just now. Yeah, well, you I were would spoiling also, films for you people. You just spoiled a film by saying somebody dies in one of the. You films. can use chapters to skip this chapter. <laughs> There's uh there's some chapters in one of the films too, and we're gonna spoil which film has chapters in it. Use the chapters in our show to skip the spoiler about those chapters. Okay. Rogue uh-huh. is not a film necessarily conducive to a graveyard. Oh. It's more conducive to an Australian outback island in a river canyon. Well but we don't record next to one of those. No, we don't have any of that here. I don't think we have one of those those words here. What was that? Outback Australian island. Outback Island in a River Canyon. River Canyon. We have a river. We do have a river. We and have it a river. Forks. Yeah, but you can't bury people in the river the way you can just leave them in the swamp. That's, That's true. an okay burial to just leave someone in a swamp or a crocodile cave. Also, um, double feature show at gmail.com. Why don't you just go ahead and type up an email that says you called them alligators instead of crocodiles? Yeah. Because I'm sure that's going to happen at some point. So Might as well get that ready now. I'm just going to go ahead and say that my incessant need to be a little bit loquacious and verbose when I'm speaking Ooh, look at you. is going to cause me to say alligator just because of how often I've said and heard crocodile right, throughout this show. Right, you need some variation. Sure. And I don't want to say reptile or lizard or newt or giant gecko. I, on the other hand, uh, am going to only say giant gecko for the okay. remainder of this, uh, just of this chapter. When we talk about the crocodiles and the innkeepers, I'll go back to uh, to Crocodile. So Rogue is directed by Greg McLean. Yeah. Who we covered on the show with John Jarrett's other film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which John is, Jarrett's other, that's an interesting way to look at that, but sure. Uh, which is Wolf Creek. Uh-huh. And he's probably the only director that I can really, I mean, director whose films make it in America. I'm sure there are Australian directors that make films about and in Australia that you know, we never see. You know, you're people again, man. They're going to start uh, telling us to watch that Mel Gibson movie with all the sand. Braveheart? I don't know what to do with you sometimes. <laughs> I just don't know what to do with you. Similar to Neil Marshall, um, they hit in the U.S., at least with the horror community, and maybe it's because they're horror films. The U.S. has a ridiculous horror community. Yeah. It's just insane. Yeah, All of us horror fans are weird, and we they're latch insane, on. I we think latch, what you mean. Yeah, I mean, we latch on. I mean, I think one of the greatest things that Dimension Film ever did it's was Dimension create Extreme. Dimension Extreme, just <laughs> yeah. exclusively because posters and DVD covers and the, you know, the, the covers that go on iTunes sure. have that red gash across the top sure. that to me just means violent movie yeah. love it by this film yeah um i talked about this at some point i think on the show probably that I had back with maybe inside dimension extreme yeah yeah there was um itunes at some point in the last year or so eh, it might have been longer now they put movies in the cloud which i got really excited about because i love the idea that i don't have to be responsible for uh-huh keeping all of my movies that they can just sit on a server somewhere and I can go to anyone's house and download a film I own. Sure. That's fantastic. Yeah. So at the time, only certain labels, labels, um, production company, whatever. Sure. Studios. Um, movie houses. Uh-huh. Yeah, studios, thank you. DVD banks. Were putting their movies in the cloud. And so I was kind of going through the 200 or whatever films that I have and figuring out which studios made which films. And Dimension makes... 85 percent of yeah. my films or something um but dimension extreme makes a lot of those films too which is just branding right yeah it's it just totally a, is yeah. and rogue is weird as a splat pack film mm. because we've covered i mean we've covered bowsman with sure. saw 
And we've covered Rob Zombie and Neil Marshall. Well, we've covered all these guys, uh, at least a little bit. Sure. Right? It's always people killing people. Yeah, right. Always. People killing people. Yeah. And here we have a giant, what was it, steam train sized crocodile. Massive gecko. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you. And uh, 18 wheeler size. Would that's you say? what I, yeah, I kept saying it was the size huge. of an 18 wheeler. It's huge, Michael. So tell me about the uh, the crocodile as the slasher then. So, the okay. So I'm, and I'm glad that's the way you worded it because that's something I want to talk about. On this show, I can, I can, anything as the slasher is yeah. basically my MO. That's, <laughs> that's the, my elevator pitch for any film. Sure. I used to be bad at elevator pitches. Uh-huh. Then I realized I can use the template blank as the slasher. <laughs> yeah. It just named the thing that appears the Dead most on. in the movie. So Rogue is about, a, I mean, I guess the title refers to the fact that it's a rogue crocodile. It's gone crazy. Sure. I mean, it's not behaving in the way that they said it would. Yeah. Or rather they expected it to. Sure. Uh, it's hyper territorial. Although it, as the film goes on, they just kind of explain how it's behavioral. Right. Why it's hunting them and, you know, it's it's marked us as a food source, stuff right. like that. But it's massive and possibly the most notable thing in the sense of double feature, the podcast. This is a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this okay. is a podcast. You got um, is that it's a giant CG crocodile and it doesn't yeah. make me angry. Yeah. <laughs> Both of those are true. Um, yeah, we, impressive CG crocodile. Yeah, I mean, my really standards is. for CG, I always try to keep them ridiculously low. But um, uh, fine job. That's some optimistic pessimism you've got going on there. I was wondering how long it would take you to invoke your new favorite idea ever. But the other thing about the phrase giant crocodile as the slasher (laughs) is that... Oh, what does our show come to? (laughs) Is that saying... So this as a splat pack film is also notable because of who because of one who dies and because of how few of them die sam worthington is yeah. in this movie avatars sam worthington well okay or so clash of the titans sam worthington so really quick before uh worthington's um star power just uh massacres everybody else in this movie so and you're saying sam worthington's star power as the slasher now yeah yeah that's exactly what that is um kate's fantastic and i'm gonna be all sad about her all over the show <laughs> but also michael varton is in this movie and I'm so glad we live in an era where we have IMDb. Yeah. Because we actually had to stop the movie and figure out what he was from. Otherwise, it would have, in a world before IMDb, I would have spent an hour and 20 minutes trying to figure out where I'm Calling know your from. friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have you seen Rogue? What was that guy in? Well, the conversation would have gone, have you seen Rogue? No. no. Okay, well, he's that one guy. He has that kind of look. Sure. On his, he's in all those... He's got a longish, longish face. TV or something. Right. But what is he from? Uh, Alias is the thing. Well, this, so this is something about, you and I mentioned TV every once in a while Mm. that we don't watch. Speaking of Splat Pack, Adam Green has a show. Also Rob Zombie. Apparently Rob Zombie too. Um, Just Google their shows. Fantastic. Adam Green. TV, yeah. So. Not Splat Pack, by um, the way. (laughs) Should be Splat Pack. I watched all of Alias spent i mean it's it's five or six seasons or something so hundreds of hours watching alias and i forgot that that's what he's from that's about how much tv goes in and out of my life but uh one of the main characters in alias sure and has done you know other film work too alias being a jj abrams so we're allowed to watch that tv show tv show yeah and then yeah so you mentioned rada mitchell who plays kate and she was on our show as the same character twice in the same film before on year one uh melinda and melinda is the yeah, point i'm trying it. to make yes um where i believe we really talked her up on that uh, yeah that episode too. she played melinda in yes. melinda and melinda thank you for that and then finally we have the slaughterhouse star power of sam worthington <laughs> yeah what that's uh, a career that could have gone much differently yeah so sam worthington plays this hillbilly backwoods bodhi poacher what? man <laughs> what are you talking about this is nuts it's true. I mean, yeah. you're right. Okay. It's just, I was like, did I, what, am I wrong? No, uh, it's just a weird fucking role it for really him. It really is. It's bizarre. Well, and I think the weirdest part is how quickly he gets, he gets et. The way they lead into the violence in this film is uh, one of my favorite parts about it. We start out, uh, you know, nature footage. Yeah. Right. We're doing the same kind of thing in Wolf Creek. Wolf Creek, I feel like was a little more subtle about it because they weren't exploiting it as uh-huh. hard. Um, look at these vast open landscapes sure. and wide shots and so forth. 
But Rogue is literally, you know, you have to realize you're surrounded by the swamp. Yeah. And well, there's a thing in the swamp. It's about the dangers of the purity sure. of the Australian sure. outback. Right. It's a portrait of exactly why you don't want to go out to those beautiful exotic places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Complete with other tourists. Great reason not to go to those exotic places. Yeah, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't start so bad. We have an unassuming boat ride. It's uh -huh. uh, the music, Michael. It's almost a lazy Sunday film, I think. <laughs> the music makes it a little lazy it Sunday. Does. Uh, that and the fact that humans are not our killers seems well, to also be a theme. I'm also going to go with blistering sunlight and yeah. flies on everyone's face. But I'm only allowed <laughs> sure. to mention that one time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And they're on a, a tour boat, and this whole beginning section isn't just hanging out, getting nothing accomplished. Right. It's an excuse for exposition. Sure. So in our collection of... Uh, wonderful devices for exposition being on a tour boat is probably one of the best it's literally well you're on a boat to learn about your killer so right. here's some fun facts sure. about crocodiles basically what learn it is, a lot in a short period is it's a bullet list and a profile of all the shit they're going to have to figure out right. how to deal with right when faced with a giant crocodile although i think in the next film when we get to the innkeepers it has my favorite exposition gimmick one chapter at a time sir um, you don't know what's relevant is kind of the thing I really like about that exposition sure. is you're getting all yeah. of these facts and some of them, they're going to check back in and you're going to go, ah, uh, crocodiles love eating dead turkeys. So that's right. important. And some of them will be completely irrelevant. The one that I remember seeing and immediately going, that's going to be the thing they're going to have trouble with Sure, is crocodiles will watch you and figure oh, yeah, out your yeah. habit. That doesn't come back. No. <laughs> it does, well, they're in the water for about six hours. Yeah, you're right. The crocodiles really don't watch them and figure out their no, anything. He, that, I think that, what that he figures out is you're stuck there and you fit in my mouth. In fact, I don't know if any of those bullet points are relevant now that I think about well, it. Well, there's the one about how crocodiles can leap up out of the oh, water sure, and eat sure. people off of a rope. Part of that is probably, uh, I mean, it's it's red herrings, but... If you want to go back to the title of Rogue, and if Double Feature has taught me anything over the years, it's never try and explain what the title means. Sure. Because, again, emails. So many emails. In your previous thesis of the crocodile being sure. uh, the rogue element here, none of the bullet points matter because it doesn't follow the rules. Part of it seems like a joke, a little tongue and teeth, <laughs> sure. tongue and cheek jab. Did you just say tongue and teeth? Yeah, I That's did. good. That's good. It's this idea that, oh, look at the cunning and sure. dangers sure. of nature's perfect killer right. of evolution. I mean, this is a dinosaur, and it's evolved to be the perfect, most fierce yeah. hunter. And you're sitting there going, oh, it's got all these techniques, and sure. it'll watch you, <laughs> sure, and it'll yeah. learn. But what you're not the thinking... the raptors in Jurassic right. Park. <laughs> but what you're not thinking is, or it could just be the size of a blimp, and it doesn't matter how it kills you, because you can't stop it. Yeah, we don't need any of these bullet points. They're <laughs> irrelevant. It's just huge, and it has a very yeah. large mouth. Right. And you're all scared. That's the, and, and, and it uses that large mouth to kill off un... Not only unsuspecting characters, but kills off characters that an unsuspecting audience is surprised to see go. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, it's part of the surprises. I mean, it's the same thing with, oh, we're setting up all these bullet points. Which ones, you know, are we going to use? Pleasantly surprised in whatever sure. it, it picks out. Keeps the audience guessing. Same thing with the characters that die. Right, well, and it starts so sneaky, too. Your initial reaction is, here comes sneaky spy croc. Yeah, right. Because it, <laughs> right. it kind of, it kind of, it, it seems like it almost slurps. The John Wayne character, it oh, slurps yeah, yeah. him from the beach. Sure. Just kind of, they turn around and he's just a ripple in the water. Yep, don't need him anymore. And you think to yourself, oh, this is a, he's, he's a super spy crocodile. He could have just as easily swam away, John right. Wayne. He's just like, <laughs> fuck this, I'm bailing. Well, then you lose Sam Worthington's character, probably the last person you think right. it's going to come down to. Uh, I love that they set him up as the asshole character, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that's usually the character you have to endure through the whole film. Don't know why movies do that. Uh -huh. And, you know, his character has more to him. I would have sure. I would have hung out with him the whole movie. That's okay. But a lot of times, the two assholes who come over in the boat, you have to suffer through them for an hour before right. they get eaten. And because movies want to make you suffer. Dessert, yeah. As if it somehow makes it better because you wait in longer. But I think it would be so much better if they're assholes and then they turn around and get eaten. And right. we're just done with that mechanic. Right. Uh, but that happens. And then Kate. Kate fucking gets attacked. Yeah, I she could gets, not believe that. She gets the old crocodile water roll. Well, it's in one of those scenes, too, where you go, well, this can't happen. It's one of the main characters. You look at your watch. 
and uh, and you go, well, we have 40 minutes left, so Kate's not going to get eaten. That can't happen. Just viciously comes out of the water yeah. and destroys her. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. And then you're left with the American guy, and you're thinking, I mean, at this point, they just send the rest of the tour group off to find help. Yeah, right. And you're just wondering what the film is going to entail sure. now, because... In a group, in a in a party of, what, 10, you can see that feasibly they can come up with some system to kill a 9,000-pound, 7-meter-long sure. giant gecko. They all kick it. Right. Everyone just chips Repeated in. Repeated kicking. Yeah, right. But what you, once Slashes it's down to it, one man and one beast, and an outsider, yeah. nonetheless, yeah. your brain goes away from the possibility of him killing sure. the crocodile. Sure, sure. And instead is just, how is he going to get away? Well, and the last thing you think is another character is going to pop up again because you get Kate back. You right. Know, it's well, kinda... kind of. You get the dog back. <laughs> sure. All right. I think uh, just because uh, they killed Sam's character off, you believe Kate's character is gone. Right. You see the whole tour troop leave and you just go, well, those characters are really gone now. They did it with Sam. They, they're going to do it with everybody. Um, you think the movie's really sticking to its guns and that, and it's another way that it surprises you. It's really all the misnomers in this film that are really pleasing. It's, uh, you know, we have that uh, strange focus on the why is it doing this element, mm -hmm. guessing the crocodile's motivation. Everybody sticks on that throughout the film. It keeps coming back up in such a way where you kind of feel like, oh, it can't just be an asshole crocodile. It has to right. have some... There's sure. a greater, we peed on its Indian burial ground right. or something, you know what it's I mean? It's genetically engineered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why is it so big, Michael? And it's so angry. <laughs> and in the end, uh, we don't know. Maybe it's just big and angry. It's That's big probably it. and angry, and it can't bite through rocks. Yeah, so we never really come back to that, because not important. The things the characters guess don't happen to be the point of the film. Right. It's just a bunch of crazy, terrified people going, why is this happening to sure. us? But in a movie where you don't have, you know, there's no supernatural killer, there's no personified killer, uh, you're not anthropomorphizing the crocodile. Right. This isn't. You some... don't get any. You don't get any sneaky looks. Just, right. There's no. There's no reaction shots <laughs> yeah. from the crocodile. From the crocodile. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Instead, you have these scenes like the rope scene where the characters basically make their own problems. Right. Their situation becomes worse because of. I mean, they're their own worst enemy. It goes back to a lot of the, the more well-done monster films in the history of Double Feature. Sure. The kind of Cloverfield movies or The Thing or uh, any of these movies where, I mean, that's one way when you're dealing with an abstract kind of concept as a killer. It's some of the, uh, the more, let's say, highbrow moments of Final Destination, uh -huh. you know, where people start to question each other or motives come into play. Because we have a killer, we can't, you know, we can't just all get pissed at it right. and suit up and go attack it. Sure. So, you know, it turns these characters in on themselves. That lets you play with the personalities of your characters a little bit more. It lets you get to know them without them having to sit down and explain their backstories right. to one another. Well, and the other thing that it results in is there's never an enduring hatred for the thing that's killing them. Right. You never hate it. You just intrepidly fear it because you know that it's just going to keep trying to eat sure. him. It has no reason. It has no rationale. Right. But at the same time, it's technically not doing anything wrong. Sure. So you can't hate it. There's <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's almost the wrong word to call it an enemy. It's just the antagonist, you know? It's, yeah, it's, it happens to be your foe in this case. Yeah, it's it's just the negative force. Right. There isn't a character on the boat whose family was killed by the crocodile 20 right. years ago and has come on this tour purely for revenge. Sure. Unless that was what John Jarrett's thing was all about. <laughs> right. Oh, I was going to say John Wayne before he swam away. <laughs> that was actually yeah. his motivation, and then he bailed. I'm sticking to him swimming away because I think that's <laughs> it's far funnier, so I'm going to pretend that's what happens. The last thing that I wanted to mention loving in this film is so weird, I don't even really know how to talk about it, but it's the uh, trigonometry of the death at the end. Yeah. Now, you kind of know what I'm talking about, right? Sure. The way that the spear death, I guess uh -huh. I can just say I like the spear death, uh -huh. and that's fine. But if I'm really going to get down to what I like about it, it's part of the, the setup and the aesthetics and, you know, our character leans against this giant fucking triangle and the crocodile's mouth is shaped like a triangle, and the, you know, the one triangle opens into the base of the other triangles, and then he hits him with a spear, which is also 
I guess, another triangle. Sure. It's not even so much, isn't it funny, there's a bunch of triangles they're yeah, using Yeah, that's in not this. at all what you're saying. If you were in charge of uh, storyboarding this scene, and just to amuse yourself, you said, I'm going to make a finale climax just out of triangles. Like, that's, <laughs> I mean, that is funny. I, I do like that. I'm not going to pretend I don't. But the way that all of these shapes kind of line up in, in such a way that he is spared because he's caught in the open gap between the two triangles. Right. And then he spears him through the fucking face. I said him, it. He spears it, Michael, not anthropomorphizing the crocodile. Right. Not going to happen. Uh, spears it and kills it. And that's, I mean, that is the death, right? Yeah. There's no rules of the slasher. Sure. Well, that we, again, it's not a slasher. It's just a giant alligator. It's not a slasher. I was wrong the whole time. My elevator pitch has failed. And furthermore, uh, to make this the antithesis of slasher films, their survivor group, so humorously named, actually survives. They yeah. all survive yeah. in the end. The uh, director who did The Innkeepers is also a very familiar name he on is, our show. He is, but he's not a splat pack director, and that's one of the reasons that we paired him up. Sure. This is, I think, I mean, there are a handful of directors that you and I would probably both say deserve to be brought to the Wikipedia page of Splat Pack. Sure. Adam Green, we already mentioned. Yeah. Probably the utmost necessary addition to the Splat sure, Pack sure. team. And right behind him is Ty West. Yeah, this is, I mean, if you really want to get to the core of this uh, double feature, I think it's names we throw out amongst all these other names that don't actually make the same film. Sure. And we just talked about Rogue and how uh, it takes a lot of, it really just kind of a surprising direction uh, to a lot of things, probably unintentionally. Sure. Just making its own film. Uh, the Innkeepers does the same thing. I feel like maybe even more deliberately takes a lot of choices to move in directions that we don't anticipate. Sure. And or to move in directions that we do anticipate and prove that it can still be done well, even yeah. though a certain track is jaded or overdone. Sure. When it becomes a cliche, it can even do the cliches yeah. well. Well, that's one of the things about Ty West. This is a, it's a director you and I have been incredibly curious about figuring sure. out because of the, the two films of his we've done right. are the, uh, the incredibly artful, the house of the devil. Right. And the goofy, campy, fucking awesome. Ca though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely amazing. But the cabin fever sequel. Yeah. Right. And so, um, in reading more and more about this guy and he came to the music box not too long ago and I didn't go because yeah. I fucked up. I should have gone and seen, did you see him talk when no, he came? No, I was going to go and then nobody oh, would go with me. Fail. See, this is what <laughs> happens. God damn it. If only there were somebody who would come to Chicago and explain Ty West to us, right? it might be Ty West. Damn it. Sorry, Ty West. We missed you. Come back. Uh, apparently, he disowned Cabin Fever 2. Right, which just adds to the... It adds to the... The mystery, right? Well, yeah, and the elegy of the kind of movies he wants to be making. Sure. Because I loved Cabin Fever 2, and I didn't think it was a bad movie at all, no. but I did definitely note that it was grossly different. different from yeah. House of the Devil. And Innkeepers is far more in line with House of the Devil it than it is. it is. But it still has the humor element that House of the Devil was entirely lacking. And that Cabin Fever definitely right. had. Definitely had. So it falls somewhere between these two points we've now made on the line. This is just apparently a college math course of an episode <laughs> of Double Feature. But if we imagine these two points on a line, it falls somewhere closer, I guess, to the House of the Devil. He said, allegedly, that the studio cut up cabin fever, changed the direction or whatever. Made a stupid cartoon intro. <laughs> that, that might be what they did. I don't know. You know, when something like that happens, you never really know how much, you know, what edits the studio made or whatever, especially right. somebody like Ty West. You have an internal tendency to just go, well, then all the good stuff must have been Ty West. And all right. the dumb stuff was the evil studio. So now we're even more confused. But it turns out he made other films. So there's still hope for us figuring this out or adding to the confusion. Aside from being the director, writer, and editor, oh, God, we love Ty West already, mm -hmm. uh, of this film, he performed the same jobs on The Roost in 2005 and on Trigger Man in 2007. So now we're taking this movie, The Innkeepers, and basically we're saying here is the most bullshit premise ever of sure. all time. This is, man, you want to make a joke about just crappy, terrible horror films fucking soulless, create, uh, creativity-deprived horror films, 
it's these hotel films. Oh, I mean, it's it's the it's a watered down version of The Shining with yeah. no creative imagination or twist. That's exactly what it is. It's there's ghosts in a hotel because who yep. knows who stayed there over the years. Yeah. And The Shining goes, and then X and X and Y and Y, and here's why these sure. people are dealing with it. The innkeepers goes, and people are looking for them. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Any uh, any movie that starts with the room number. Or the haunting of uh, whatever a hotel, state, country, or, or hotel. Yeah, God, it's just, the hotel one specifically because it's always the same fucking thing. Sure, somebody died in this room, and now some guy and then a yeah. writer stays. Right. Sure. <laughs> right, that's what it is. And then you find their body, oh. and you think, okay, now their spirits at rest, but now the spirits just even angrier. Yeah, it's mad. And there's no reason. That spirit's pissed. And then you end up having to join the spirit in death beside oh. you in time. I'm <laughs> I was looking forward to joining you finally. What stop spirit. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> yes, it did. So we take this bullshit premise and we say, how will Ty West this seems like an experiment you and I set up. Take worst premise ever and one of most promising directors we can possibly yeah. think of but don't understand and throw him at that premise well, and that's see because, what happens. And you said this to me a while ago, and this is something that I just want to make sure that we put on the show. When it comes to pairing things up, uh -huh. you and I are the best two people. Sure. In the United States. It's Probably one of the only the talents we have. If there's a global United Nations of pairing things up, sure. we would be the United States delegates right. to that kind well, of Well, because we don't apartment. know the other films. <laughs> right. In a world where we can go, where we can look at two lists, two columns, and look at premise, and then a list of directors, sure. we could come up with a great film out of every premise. Yeah. If a team of people does the work for column A yeah. and another team does the work for column B, we can put those teams together we would in the be most awesome effective at just way. Pointing at two of them and making something interesting that no one would want to pay for. And that thing is the innkeepers, I think. So the way we start this is using the world's cheapest scare shot. Right away, Ty West is yeah. already just trying to uh, throw more question marks into things. Um, I want to know from you. We're showing the audience one of those stupid YouTube videos. Sure. It's just a, a scary chair and ghost face. And it's, I mean, it is the world's cheapest scare shot. Yeah. So does showing somebody in a movie, showing someone else the world's cheapest scare shot, and then by proxy showing the audience, does that allow you to get away with that? I think what it does is it sets the premise for the reality of the film the world of the film which is that these people are not devoid of the idea that ghost hunting capital g capital yeah, h right. is true and stupid yeah I, I, <laughs> sure. and by true i Both mean happens yeah not legitimate yeah i feel like it's a jibe that they're not completely devoid of pop culture they're aware yeah. of where the paranormal lives in society sure. they and know that what they're talking it's, about it's it's mostly a gimmick it's mostly a device for scaring the shit out of people, getting a cheap thrill. And I mean, he says it right in the beginning. Lucas says it in the beginning. It's it, it sells right. Yeah. Right then. I can't tell if this movie is set in the 90s sure. because of all the weird angles and the fact that it right. looks like eerie Indiana. Well, in the way the camera quickly moves in on sure. shots, it's perfect. It does have a lot of those relics of, uh, of the 90s. This is something you were pointing out to me before is that and maybe one of the things that make us really interested in Ty West. Sure is that he kind of grew up when we grew up. Right. Well, we we kind of hail all these directors like Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino and, you know, Rob Zombie, these directors that we talk about all the they time. They 10 or 20 love. years on us. And these are all directors that are making 70s films yeah. in the 2K. Sure. Ty West is probably the first director that we've really been able to latch onto because he's doing horror in an interesting way and he's making these solid, innovative, well-crafted films. Sure. But he's... Our age. I mean, yeah. the reason we're watching The Innkeepers and being able to go, this is so 90s, is because he grew up watching the same movies right. we grew up watching. His yeah. horror background is the same ones sure. that we saw. I mean, he, sure. you know, he's probably seen The Dentist and he saw, <laughs> right. he saw the Sunday afternoon presentation of Critters 2. Yeah, right. You know, he saw Gremlins 2 before Gremlins because Gremlins 2 was the one that they had rights to on WGN. Sure, sure. And that's... Yeah, I think he's in his late 20s when he made this or yeah. something. 30 years old. So, you know, in the, the films previous to this, I mean, he grew up in the 80s. He experienced a lot of the films of the 90s. This film, whether it's intentional or not, you know, this is our first time, both of us, seeing this. So we'll come back through it. But uh, even if this isn't set in the 90s, it is undeniable yeah. using the mechanics of 90s 
scary, you know, well, and that's the thing Friday is, night movie films. Is the 90s film aesthetic for horror is so conducive to the cheesy <laughs> yeah. ghost it is plot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it the angles are uncomfortable. Sure, it's always a little goofy, but it's just enough levity for you to be floored when something scary happens. Sure. you drop. Yeah, and I well, mean, well, the the camera move-ins are easy for me because you can right. see, you know, it's somebody zooming in on a, right. a camera thing. But the angles are weird. These aren't so we're not talking just Dutch angles. These aren't just tilt your camera 45 right. degrees. What, why do these look so askew? I, I think that the camera's pitched and rotated a little. I mean, it it looks like it's pushed forward and down and to the right. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and then So twisted. like the garage scene is one of yeah. those. Or the yeah. case of the Mondays where, I mean, that one it's just slightly skew. Right. I always think back to, uh, with the Zoom specifically, mm -hmm. but the Goosebumps TV show. Oh, totally that kind of the, stuff. The Remember um, Say Cheese and Die? The first time they look at the Polaroid? And no, it's skeletons. No, not at all. And the camera just zooms in on the reaction because there it's skeletons. Go. Right. And, uh, but no, but I, I mean, I can imagine that moment perfectly sure. having never even seen it. Right. Because of how distinctive those. And, you know, you can feel the score swell in the yeah. background to also tell you that this right. is a big moment. Sure. The score is just as fucking goofy in this movie. The score might be, I mean, half of why the movie's kind of funny is that score speaking of the comedy in the film and this is what i think is one of the most ingenious portions of the film mm -hmm. is that the comedy is this really poignant tool that the film uses not as relief which is a whole other thing but it's this kind of technique that the writing has used to give the characters humanity yeah um, yeah definitely one of the things that is always absent especially from horror films is they give you the goofy stoner character, the guy yeah. with the hat who everybody loves, and oh my god, that guy's hilarious. The rest of the characters are always flat, sure. and they die first. Sure. This movie goes and says these characters are human beings. They miss jokes. Sometimes they make hilarious jokes. Sometimes solely the way they react to a situation inspires humor. Yeah. Um, one of the and this goes back to the thing I was talking about with the expositional gimmick. When Luke says, why are you so surprised yeah. that I talk to the customers? You and I are surprised by that, too. Right. I'm well, way surprised by that. Explain the background of characters yeah. just flat out. One character sure. goes, here's their backstory. Yeah. And then you go, how do you know that? He's like, I work at the hotel. Yeah, I talk to these people. Come on. <laughs> well, especially being a quiet hotel in yeah, its final days. Yeah, two people live there. Yeah, you, uh, you work at that front desk and you talk to one other person right. all day. So when another individual comes in... You, you'll put up with their whole backstory. Sure. Claire might not when she goes to the coffee place and the chick wants to tell her everything. She right. doesn't give a fuck. Well, and that's, I mean, that's just a sign of Claire's character. Yeah, that's right. a sign that that's not she, who she is. She's a, she's a shoot first, ask questions later, and she's she'll get wrapped up in herself before she gets wrapped up yeah, in the definitely. actual, the, the whole world. Yeah. You know, when we have a small cast like this, and that's something we saw in The House of the Devil as well, and we have a couple more peripheral kind of characters who you know, come in and out in this movie that I like a lot. But I do think that Luke is, Claire and Luke both, but Luke is really interesting in, in kind of setting up that skeptical mindset. Yeah. Because you have, you were talking earlier about they're aware of ghost hunters. Sure. This is a world where we have ghost hunters. The characters know about ghost hunters. They know that it's a lucrative business even. They they have the evil inside uh, Pentium right. notebook. And a solid GeoCities website complete <sighs> with a counter. The spooky website is so <laughs> fucking accurate. So this is another thing I know we've mentioned at some point on the show is that um, Chicago and our giant cemetery and all that, we have a huge ghost hunter kind of industry Well, it's because it's haunted as hell. No, we just got our first no. ghost tour. Did you know that? What are you talking about? There's Chicago bus ghost tours now. Like well, well, see, New this Orleans is, style? I was mentioning this to you a while ago. We've had that a while. Really? They're just not as popular as the Chicago chocolate tour. I've or started whatever seeing other. the buses yeah, drive man. by. Yeah, those, uh, those have existed a while because we have... Well, who knows why they exist? Because well, it makes money, right? I yeah, mean, that's and why uh, what, John Dillinger died in Lincoln Park next to the I, Biograph I, Theater? Oh, you mean there's famous people that were in Chicago at their time of death? Yeah, isn't yeah, that, that crazy? Yeah, that surprises me Ghosts get lot. trapped where they die. This film proves it. But the spooky fucking website, if you've ever been on these, they look just like them. This oh, is yeah. clearly Dead a thing on. where they went to these websites and found the funniest parts of them. And After Chinese them. Pancakers Triple X. Oh, my God. What was it? Tit Punch or something? Tit Punch. Is one of the... His history of <laughs> porn websites is, oh man, it's one of those TiVo kind of moments. Yeah. 
So, you know, it's got the bad video on it and the broken uh, image uh, yeah. icon, the orbs. I love that. Yeah. Anytime you start talking about ghost photos, you have to talk about orbs, which is uh, things lens that flare. are shiny in your, yeah, basically lens flare. It's lens flare. Things that are shiny in your shitty camera, or maybe it's got a little uh, little bit of grease on the sure. lens. Or, or some dust that's out of focus. It skirts mockery, but it's also just accurate to what these characters sure. are about. And you kind of have this question right away, well, does Luke buy this? Is this kind of, you're getting to know Luke, so you don't know if that's his demeanor, or if he just thinks this is all fucking nonsense. Right. Well, and you, you kind of pick up early on that he's into Claire, and you're wondering... Yeah whether or not this is something he's pursuing out of his own interest or because he sure. knows that it's something that will keep Claire around. Well, and eventually you have the moment where he says, oh yeah, it's all bullshit. It's hocus pocus, I think he calls it. You kind of find that he's setting up his backstory like he's a jaded ghost hunter. That, oh, when he first started getting into all this stuff, blah, 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 and then he found that, you know what, your little stupid meter thing goes up and it means nothing. right. Which doesn't happen often enough to Ghost Hunters. Sure. They move on to another form of pseudoscience. You mean like with a glass diamond pendulum? Are you calling acting a pseudoscience? Is that what you just you did know, there? I, I, maybe a little. No, but I mean, you're, you're right. That's exactly what they go to. They go from crystals to chi to orbs. Well, I mean, basically... I'm sorry, I believe the path was indigo children to vaccines cause autism <laughs> to oxygen TV show. I just think that um, a lot of... People, when it comes to pseudoscience, just have to move deeper into it. Right. Because the deeper you go, the harder it is. I mean, not really. You and I <laughs> both know that it's not. But the harder it becomes to disprove when you use something like chi. Yeah. You say the word chi. You say... It's so vague you say and generic. Chakra. It, yeah. Um, what does it even mean? To find a way to disprove the alignment of one's chakra is so much more convoluted than to disprove the existence of a ghost. Sure. I mean, to disprove There's the existence of a ghost, There's you point tangible. at anything yeah. and go, ain't no ghost. Right, right. Well, if you move away from a falsifiable hypothesis, sure. then no one can falsify your hypothesis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he later admits to making this stuff up, sure. too. So it does seem more like it was a... It might be a vague interest of his right and something he finds that you know two people work together they look for common ground right he found some common ground with claire and he dove into it i feel like at the end of the film before the very last second when the door slams right you're sitting there and the film is exactly even 50 50 no such thing as ghosts probably such thing as ghosts oh you know what probably I'm... such thing as paranormal okay spirits i'm completely buying it before that's i don't know why well, but just because i think i let me let me explain sure a little bit sure. um so we have three characters in the film right and a mother and a son yeah the mother and the son i'm gonna write off and also that's the fine. uh the old man who kills himself neither of them play into the actual existence of the paranormal okay and we have luke mm -hmm. we have claire and we have lee yeah luke is Hard line, no such thing as spirits, ghosts, or the paranormal. By the end of the film, he is definitively right. off the boat. He's the, the skeptic character, but not in the most straightforward sense. Right. It's a unique take on that character because the way he came to his skepticism isn't the sort of, you know, hard brick wall background sure. that we would anticipate from a, a cookie cutter skeptic character. Yeah, it's almost by failed practice. Yeah, yeah, that's precisely <laughs> what it is. But you have to remember these characters are not necessarily from our world. Right. They may be, and this is where I think you're going with this, sure. they may be from a world right. where spirits exist. Sure. So he's definitely our skeptic champion right. here. So let's put him on the zero spiritual end of the spectrum. Yeah. And then Lee will be at the 100 end sure. of the paranormal. We're spectrum. setting up another line graph. This yeah. is good. Yeah. She is, she's the one that, you know, has the explanation for why she can see what she sees and how she can communicate the way she communicates. Right. And she's part of the community sure. and she's been involved and she's had these she goes experiences, to conferences, man. It's the sure. opposite of the amazing meeting. That's so what's she happening is, here. She is a hundred percent convinced of the paranormal yeah. as if it is the most common sense assertion. Okay, so at this point, we're breaking even. We have one at zero and one at 100. And then there's Claire, who is believes there is the paranormal, but refuses to accept it without contact. Sure. She's searching for the evidence to disprove 
or prove either of the other yeah. two characters she correctly. Just, she wants to see it. She right. wants to experience it. And we get this moment toward the end, um, the scene right before the blackout, mm -hmm. where she gets essentially attacked by this ghost. And at that moment, I'm hoping the film doesn't end because the film is basically saying, turns out there are ghosts. Surprise. Well, not ghosts. Spirits. Sorry. Let's, I mean, come spirits. on here. That's kind of a weird take on that too, right? Yeah. There is no end, no beginning. Right. So it's just, it's sort of secular ghosts, sure. which is a weird idea. Sometimes you talk to people, they claim to be atheists, they still believe in ghosts. Sure. We've had friends like that, yeah. right? Kind of a, a strange partitioning right. of ideas in your head. Um, but this is a theory on spirits sure. that doesn't necessitate afterlife. Right. And by the end of the film, when you get attacked and killed by a ghost, the film is definitively saying this is a world of ghosts. Sure. But then you get that epilogue where they point out that Claire died because she didn't have her inhaler. Right. And it was too dark. And we've been seeing this inhaler the whole time. And they totally didn't hamster it the way that we were. I was expecting them to. Oh, yeah, it just right. happened that that time she didn't have the inhaler. Sure. And they had showed you that she needed an inhaler, but not the inhaler was the crux and the climax. It yeah. just happened to be the rationale. Um, so she'd gotten worked up and died from the inhaler. And then I start questioning, well, she's been so wanting, you know, her idol believes in this. Sure. Lee is her, one of her favorite actors. She wants to be close to her and yeah, have right. these same. So may, then I start thinking she's the only one who's seen anything. Right. And maybe it's just been one of those tricks of the brain and she's alone by herself in this hotel and she wants to believe it so badly Absolutely. that all this rationale happens. And so then... With the inhaler, I go, ah, there never were spirits. Right. And then we have Lee in the room, which is maybe contacting Claire, you know, maybe channeling Claire. Okay, well, sure. But then she just walks out and you never see anything. Right. And she has that, that end scene right. where there's kind of, again, the house of the devil. Sure awkward tension exactly it uh it does go back to a lot of those 60s and 70s kind right. of things yeah. that are unspoken sure. sort of moments um and then which is great juxtaposed against what are essentially crystal uh you know ouija board yeah. kind yeah. of kind absolutely of i mean that's what that thing is no, yeah. right it's a yeah. ouija board yeah. and uh and so at that moment i'm saying i'm just sitting there kind of angry because i feel like the film has gotten to the point where it's not going to make a decision sure and then you could we, read into things either way. Right. When Lee's talking about a great tragedy in the sure. hotel, she's probably just talking about their website. Sure. <laughs> and then, which is the greatest tragedy that ever happened in the hotel, right? No, it's got to be. Sorry, what? Then we creep back into the room. Oh, right. And we sit staring at it, and I'm wondering if they're going to do the QuickTime video. But I think it's an illusion It would have been a really time funny video. if they did the... And the door slams. And that is, to me, that is the film saying, Claire's spirit is in the hotel, spirits are real. Yes. Probably. Uh, well, exactly. That's what I said. I think it tips the scales 51 to 49 in sure. favor of the paranormal. Sure. <laughs> which is just enough of a definitive stance for me to be on board with the film not pulling a bullshit you decide ending. It tips it's, it back in fun ghost movie. Right. But what Hey, it, I'm just making a fun ghost movie. What it here. doesn't do is it doesn't piss me off by being a by being white noise too. It still manages to be a film, uh, you know, to, to have this kind of craft to it that we expect from Ty West. Mm-hmm. To be treated with, uh, I mean, subtlety, I guess, is the wrong word for for fun ghost movie. Well, but I mean, it is the thing that I love about Ty West with House of the Devil and with Cabin Fever and now with The Innkeepers is that he takes classically unsubtle subjects sure. and proves that with a little touch of nuance and subtlety, sure. the movies don't have to suck mm. and they don't have to be campy sure. and they can make a statement about something like ghosts or, you know, the subject matter in House of the Devil or the subject matter in sure. Cabin Fever. Sure. They can take something that we've seen time and time again and we know, ha ha, that happens. Oh my God. Yeah. And instead go, here's a way of looking at the human. Yeah. Just the human, you know, the it gives humanity to the film. Yeah. I think it's, it's the human experience. That's the phrase I'm looking for. Here's a way of looking at the human experience through the lens of those who believe in the paranormal sure. or of those who are confronted right. with this type of situation sure. because without actually confronting them with a situation like a haunted hotel we don't get that aspect that facet of the human experience right. and it's so quickly lost when you're trying to make a hilarious crazy scary horror film it's what makes us sound like dicks when we come on here and go haha these people believe that fuck those people. right this is a movie about how endearing those people yeah. might be right it's not 13 ghosts right <laughs> right well and it's a lot of it comes down to you know the tone it's 
a, still a movie that it doesn't just take this premise and slap down all the other movies that have done this. No. Because so easily it could go, oh, ghost movies are bullshit, and now I'm going to show you why by making the super ultimate best ghost movie yeah. ever. Instead, it has just enough of those elements to almost kind of pull that back up as, hey, there's potential to sure. this. Sure. You know, you think about something like the after she sees the scary piano, yeah. right? And she brings Luke in the room, and now Luke is mocking the scary piano. Right. And in a moment where we all think that Luke's going to see a ghost, and that's where the movie's going, instead, it pans back to Claire, who's also having sure. fun with the scene. Right. Now these two are kind of mocking the genre, but kind of being a part right. of the genre at the same time. It doesn't break the ghost film formula. It mm. adheres almost entirely to your standard sure. ghost film formula it just shows that it's not the formula that's broken right right yeah <laughs> well you can still do a lot of amazing things with it i mean the you know the the garage scene says a lot about the yeah. tone too that beginning one but uh you're making a film that as a director is as tense as house of the devil gets uh in some of the moments from the innkeepers but is also still this light and this fun it has these, um, you know, these different choices it makes that, like you say, let it fall easily into this genre, but do something different with it. Stuff like the, the places it chooses to scare you. Sure. Or what it does with those scares. You know, one of the most interesting choices, I think, of, of the whole thing is when they go down to the basement um, and, oh, yeah. oh my God, you know, the spirit, right? So they're, they're listening to the audio tapes or whatever, and... Uh, Luke's freaking the fuck out. You can see that visibly. He's shaking. Mm -hmm. And they build up all of this tension to the scare moment, which happens in every fucking horror movie. And when Claire says, oh my God, the thing, it's right behind you. At that point, they have now earned, they've milked the scene long enough. They've earned Panda Luke, show the scary fucking thing behind him, run out of the room. Everybody has fun. The audience screams. But they don't do it at all. Luke just bails. Right. Claire claims to see the thing. We don't know if she sees well, it or and, whatever. And to me, I was just really sure she was trying to play an She's elaborate prank to get yeah. back for the quick time joke. Well, and, you know, he's running out of that scene and we're given all that time to think, well, wait, hold on. Do we pan back? Do we show the what happened in that scene? And, you know, it makes the scene itself more impactful because the objective is accomplished. We learned a bit about Luke. And we saw his reaction, and then that's what provoked him to say, well, I made it all up. But it's so much more meaningful that we don't try and throw the scene away on, oh, I was just milking tension for a scare. Sure, and going back to that gradient of paranormal that I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, by not showing it, it maintains that still only Claire has seen it. Sure. I feel like, and I, I know that it doesn't mean that. But I feel like if they were to show Luke with the spirit behind him, that's the same as showing Luke seeing the spirit. Yeah. I mean, if you put them in the frame and Luke is reacting to something that isn't really there, right. it's really the only way to go back and rectify it is to do a flashback sure. where you show the same scene and there's nothing behind Luke and Claire right, imagine right. the whole thing. And that's, I mean, you don't do that. Well, that's either way, I mean, even if you think you're reading into it too much, sure, it's leaving the ambiguity there. Oh, yeah. And that's the intention. And that's the power of it, for sure. He's running away and the audience can think anything now. The first thing that comes to my mind is they didn't show the fucking whatever. Why is the movie making that? Cho what a clever and just different, bizarre choice because you see the mechanic coming so far away. You just see milking it, milking it, milking it, and then no payoff. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a bizarre choice that then gives so much more weight to that scene. But it still has the, the scare payoffs. They're just in maybe unexpected areas. You have all this tension build. And then in moments like uh, when Claire's at the top of the stairs, she's poking her flashlight down in the bottom. We haven't even built up the tension yet. We're doing the thing where we pan back and forth. Mm. And in one of the pans, we look back up at her and the scary fucking guy's behind yeah. her. You don't expect that at all because you're going, oh, we're still in the milking process. Right. And halfway through, we haven't even built the tension yet. You weren't ready for that. You right. were waiting for them to pan back and forth six or seven more yep. times. Can we watch more Ty West things? I don't care if they're try. terrible. I don't know if we I can just, find them. Um, I'm going to look for them and we're okay. going to watch them. I am in love with Ty West. We have different movies we're going to do on the show next time. Check out the upper right-hand corner of our website, which is doublefeatureshow.com, and it'll tell you what the movies are, in case we don't. But we will. Unlike The Innkeepers, we are a very predictable uh, program that <laughs> adheres to a format. 
Email us about that format, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, and then that thing that you do at the end. Next time we're moving into, uh, this is one of my most excited pairs so far this year. Oh, good. Uh, we're doing a sci-fi double feature about blowing up celestial bodies. Great. We're doing Dark Star, John Carpenter's first film, and Sunshine, which is directed by um, Slumdog Millionaire, Danny Boyle. That's celestial bodies, and I thought Barbarella. Is that wrong of me? No, I think... You, you know, actually meant celestial bodies. You didn't mean... You weren't watch making... Watch more fucking film. Ugh, fine. Bye.